Hello, everyone. I may well have met some of you in previous conferences because I was covering this for the Marian Fathers and writing about it, but not ever actually speaking. So this is a privilege. Thank you, Ellen and Ed. Um, and I really hope that you all enjoy the book. I hope that you take some time at least to at least glance through the questions and see if anything resonates. So let me start with a fairly blunt assessment of the state of the church. We're in the greatest crisis since the Reformation. Anyone wish to argue against that? <laughs> These are hard times. These are uniquely hard times, but we also have uniquely great graces in order to meet them. So let's, let's begin with that. I wrote a book called How Can You Still Be Catholic? Because we all have to be able to answer that question. We are told by St. Peter, always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope. It is part of being a Christian that we should be able to answer to people, how can you still be a Christian? How can you still be a Catholic? How can you still have this hope in the face of this world, in the face of these scandals, in the face of these challenges? And so I'm going to try to go through some of the reasons, at least that I've got, how can I still be Catholic? and hopefully give you a little preparation for going back out into the world again after this conference and having to face that question. Because I don't think we're going to be done facing that question anytime soon, right? This is going to be a challenge probably for the rest of our lives. But there's a lot of hope, and I'll get into that as well. So my story, I was raised Catholic. Uh, my mom is Catholic, my dad is Protestant. Mom's side of the family is Catholic, dad's side of the family is Protestant. So it was, it was always, everybody agreed on the fundamentals. Everybody, Jesus is Lord. Like, everybody was clear on that. But everything else was either debated or just not discussed. Dad was really, really good about respecting what he'd promised when he married Mom. He was really good about raising me and my sister Catholic. He was really good about making sure we went to Mass and all of the sacraments and all the formation. In fact, he was a better mass goer than a lot of Catholic dads. Every dad was Coast Guard as well, so we moved a lot, and every time we moved parishes, he kept getting invited to join the Knights of Columbus. <laughs> because they kept seeing him at mass with mom, and they would ask him, have you thought about joining the Knights? And he would say, well, do you take Protestants? <laughs> and they stopped asking <laughs> until we moved again. <laughs> so. It was a unique upbringing. And at a certain point as I was growing up, I thought, I owe it to myself and I owe it to the family, I owe it to Christ to really think through, what do I believe? I've been raised Catholic, I like the Mass, you know, it's fine. Do I believe it? And so I took a shortcut. I went online and I found the online atheists. And I, because I figured the easiest way to figure out is this true is to hear the best arguments against it or what people think are the best arguments against it and find out if they have any merit. Because if they, all right, if they do, then all right, we'll take this seriously and I'll get out. If on the other hand, the church has good answers, if there's real reasons to be Catholic, I'll stick with that. And so I dove into online apologetics which can be a full contact sport if nobody, if you haven't ever gone online on those message boards or explored Facebook. It's, it's amazing. Um, some of the people are insane. <laughs> but it was, I, I think it really was the quickest way to find out, all right, what are the arguments against the faith? What are the church's greatest weaknesses? What have we screwed up? And so I heard the arguments and then I did my research. And read up on the Crusades, read up on the Inquisition, read up on great sins, read up on great saints, read up on acts of extreme sanctity and acts of extreme sin, because it's all there in the history of the church, guys. We've had 2,000 years to get it right, and we've had 2,000 years to screw it up, and we've done both. We have had extraordinary men and women for hell or for heaven. And at the, you know, in the course of this, at a certain point, I was amazed at the church kept turning up with the winning hand. Largely because consistently, when we screwed up, it was because we didn't live the faith. It wasn't that we were such faithful Catholics that we harmed other people. It was we were sinners. 
and so bad things happened. Our own faith is better than our worst moments. The faith is better than we are, which means it's worth believing even when we screw it up. And eventually I came to the conclusion, not only is it better than we are, the faith is true. Jesus is real. Mary is real. The church is, in fact, established by God. The apostles were delegated by God to teach. It's true, at which point, all right, you have no other choice. This is the truth. And so out of that conviction then, I tried to compile some of what I'd found and put it in a book for other people to be able to read and see. There are reasons for our faith. Our faith is not something that we are called upon to believe blindly. It is not something we are called upon to believe without reason. It's not something that we are meant to do in spite of our minds. We are meant to believe because we have seen. And what do we see? We see this sort of gathering. We see the faith of our fellow Catholics. We see the faith of our priests and our religious. We see the faith of our friends and family. We see the faith of great saints. We see the faith of great writers. We, we see miracles through divine mercy. We have reasons for our faith. In the mercy of God, we have reasons for our faith. We will also have times we are tempted to doubt or we're tempted to forget all of those reasons where we're suffering, we're in pain, something has gone wrong. And it's, it's in those moments that, yeah, there is something blind about faith. Yeah, there is something you just, you just have to hold on. But you have to hold on to the memory of your reasons. You have to hold on to the memory of the miracles, the memory of the saints, the memory of 2,000 years again of great works of mercy and of great richness. It's not blind. So Catholicism is true. I come to this conclusion. Does this mean that the people who don't believe the faith are somehow terribly wrong or terribly disordered or terribly screwed up? No, because faith isn't just about our choice. It's an important part, but there are three key contributors to any one person's faith. The first is God. The second is the person. And the third is the body of Christ. With those three, we have faith. One of those three drops out, it gets a lot harder and maybe impossible to believe. So there's a reason why friends, family have left the faith, but we also have a way to help bring them back. So let's start talking about God's choice, God's choice that we have faith. Faith is a gift. I think a lot of us forget that. The fact that we believe isn't because we're great. The fact that we believe is a gift from God. Faith is a theological virtue. It comes through the Holy Spirit. It comes through God's love. We don't deserve it. Faith is a gift. So a consequence of that, we don't make converts. The Holy Spirit makes converts. So the greatest thing we can do for those of us, for those who don't believe, those who we love who don't believe, is to pray for them is to receive the sacraments and offer up some of that grace on their behalf. Because again, if grace isn't there, they will never believe. We can help with that. On the other hand, if God wills it, our faith will endure past everything. It does not matter what the world or the flesh or the devil throw at us. If God is giving the grace and we are saying yes to that grace, we can endure anything by the grace of God. Faith comes from God's choice to give it to us. But we also have the responsibility to make our choice, our choice for faith, our choice to say the creed again, our choice to believe, to hold on in the hard times, and to hold on in prosperity. And it may be harder to hold on in prosperity sometimes than it is to hold on in suffering. We see that again and again in the history of the church. Christ warned us in the Gospels that the wise won't get it. The fool's will makes the church an awful spectacle for the world sometimes, but it's also a tremendous gift. It's not necessarily about mind. It's not necessarily about, do you have a doctorate? Do you have a master's degree? Do you, have you read a lot? It's not about that. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's about listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to the still small voice that Dr. Stackpole's been talking about. 
It's about allowing the Lord to show you, to open you up to the reality of the Eucharist, to open you up to the reality of divine mercy, to open you up to love of your neighbor, to the fact that your neighbor is lovable, and the fact that you are lovable, and you are loved by God. If we are not reminded by the Holy Spirit, we may forget that our entire existence depends upon God's love. From moment to moment depends upon God's love, such that no one is forgotten, no one is unloved. If they were forgotten or unloved by God, they would cease to exist. The fact that you can even ask the question, does God love me? It means the answer is yes, you are loved by God. So we have a choice, we have to say yes to the faith, we have to say yes to belief. How do we do that today? How do, we, how do we choose to remain Catholic, even in the face of scandal, even in the face of betrayal? We have to keep coming back to the faith is better than we are. The faith is better than me. The faith is better than all of us alive today. The only people to perfectly live the faith, Jesus, Mary, and those great saints who were nigh on perfect, St. Joseph, John the Baptist. Because it's not about simply checking off the rules or following all the rules. It's about perfect love. Loving perfectly is something that I'm not good at. <laughs> Anyone who's good at, you know, please let me know and tell me how you're doing it because that's awesome. We are in a church with a faith that is better than we are. And this is our great reassurance. This is our great hope. The faith calls us to love ourselves. You can't love your neighbor as you love yourself if you don't love yourself. We're called to love our neighbor. We're called to love our enemy. We're called to love our friends. We're called to love everyone. The faith is better than we are. Some people think that having morals that are better than you live is hypocrisy. I would say that that's not true. I hope that my morals are better than my life. I hope that everyone's morals are better than their life. I hope that people are reaching towards a higher goal than they are currently living. The world's not doing well. <laughs> we need to be trying for something better. Hypocrisy is when you deny that you're a sinner. Hypocrisy is when you say, there's nothing wrong with me. But the faith is designed to kill hypocrisy. Look at the, look at the things we pray. Look at the mass, look at the confidior at the start. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, and say it if you remember it, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. And I ask, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God, Every Mass, we confess our sins. Every Mass, we break hypocrisy. Every Mass, we acknowledge, I am not worthy, Lord, that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. We are supposed to have a moral code of infinite love. We are supposed to have a moral code that is better than we are. This is one of the great reasons to remain Catholic, remain following a higher ideal, than you are currently living. And sometimes, occasionally, in moments of absolute generosity, you meet it. Some people, for decades at a time, Mother Teresa, for Pete's sake, Mother Teresa, <laughs> there you have someone who has poured themselves out in love. That's what it looks like when we get it right. Another reason to be Catholic. Our prayer is designed to save us from hypocrisy. Our prayer is designed to save us from our pride and our sin, the Hail Mary, the Our Father. Think through just how often we acknowledge honestly that we are not holy. And in that acknowledgement, we become able to be holy. When we know that it's all the divine mercy, the divine mercy is free to act. I can believe because the faith is better than we are. There's another important thing we need to be able to remind people. Of course there are sinners in the church. If there weren't any sinners in the church, we'd have to go out and bring them in. It is our job to bring the sinners to the field hospital of the church, as Pope Francis likes to say, where they, we, we can be healed, we can be made well by the medicine of the sacraments. Yes, sometimes the patients hurt each other. 
Sometimes the patients fail to take their medicine. Doesn't mean you leave the hospital. Doesn't mean you run away from the place where you can be healed. But we are all together in that hospital where the sick people are in order to be made well. And we can be made well. How do we know that? How do we know the medicine works? How do we know that there's hope? Before he was Pope Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger once addressed a meeting in Rimini, Italy, and he said that the only two really good reasons for the Catholic faith are the saints and the beauty that the church, the, that Catholics have created. Keep in mind the saints. Do not forget the saints. Read about the saints. This is how it's done. This is life worth living. This is life lived well. And with the saints come miracles. With the saints come proofs for the existence of God, for the power of the sacraments, for the power of prayer. With the saints come all the evidence you'll ever need. And the beauty that the church has produced, the beauty of her works of mercy, the beauty of the universities, the beauty of the hospitals, the beauty of the religious orders, the beauty of love, the beauty of truth, goodness, of life. This is a real part of our heritage as well as the sin. We can't give up on either one when we're talking to people. We can't just, we can't just ignore all the sin and we can't just ignore all the beauty. Both have to be part of that conversation if we're going to be realistic about it. But even with all of that, in the face of this present crisis, which has been so awful and so evil, how, how do we persist? How do we keep going? I think the fundamental thing that I keep in mind, and I have always kept in mind, really, from the time I really started thinking about this, is that we can never expect the clergy, the hierarchy as a whole, to be better than the apostles. Because think through the apostles, guys. They... All 12 of them abandoned Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. One was a flat-out traitor, Judas. One was called Satan by Jesus because he tried to say that you don't have to actually suffer the passion and death. Peter, the first pope. You can't expect the clergy to be better than the apostles. So at any age in the church, there's going to probably be one twelfth of them Judases. There's probably going to be one twelfth of them John the Beloved Disciple. But all of them, if the Holy Spirit comes, if they're open to him, all of them can be transformed and become the pillars of the church again. We must pray for our priests. We must pray for our bishops. We must love them. We must help them with our prayers and doing our role as lay people. If we do that, then there is, there is hope in this age for the church. I need to get to another key piece of hope quickly because I'm almost out of time. The, the number one thing that we're called to do in this age is listen to Fatima. You've, a lot of you who have been here before have heard Father Andrew Apostoli speak from the stage, I think. You've heard him talk about the first Saturdays. We must be doing the first Saturdays of reparation to the Immaculate Heart. It is the most forgotten devotion in the church today. It is, today is the first Saturday, in fact. So go to confession. Receive the Eucharist with the intention of reparation today. Pray a rosary with the intention of reparation to the Immaculate Heart. And spend at least 15 minutes meditating on one or more of mysteries of the rosary today. Let this be the start of doing five first Saturdays. Our Lady promised that in the end, her Immaculate Heart would triumph. She promised this in 1917. We have not properly done the first Saturdays in that time. How do we know that? We don't yet have that promised era of peace. The consecration was made in 85. John Paul II, Sister Lucia, Pope Benedict confirmed it. But we haven't yet done the first Saturdays. If you want to help reform, renew the church, I would say that's where we start. And then we must persist. We must persist. We must persist with the first Saturdays to lead other people to it. We must persist with the daily rosary for peace. We must persist with sacraments and reading scripture, reading the diary, spreading the word about divine mercy and Mary Immaculate. These two pillars will lead us out of this crisis. Jesus and Mary are the way out. <laughs>